Steve Cross, the executive, the executive vice president of sales and marketing from Semestec, and he will present the case study fertility management in rodents to improve farm operations. So I believe you have seen a little bit during the advertisement during the, the coffee, during the coffee break. So let me introduce Steve and I wish you a good morning, Steve. How are you today? Oh, uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, very well. Very well. So I wait for, uh, your, um, for your presentation to your screen to be shared and then we can start. Um, do you see this? No, I still like, can you see it. Let's try this. All right, now I can see it. Here okay. We Here we are. So you can uh, show the, you can put in the presentation mode and then uh, we can start. All right, perfect. So, Steve, the stage is yours. And I just would like to remind to everybody, of course, you will have, uh, after the presentation, the virtual tour. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's good to be here. It's a pleasure. So far, we've heard many exciting conversations regarding animal welfare and productivity and measuring the impacts of abiotic stresses on farm animals primarily. I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the continued plagues we have with productivity of farm animals, and that evolves around rodents, namely rats and mice. Um, personally, I, I'm trained as a public health entomologist, where I spent about 20 years in integrated pest management of disease vectors, uh, primarily human and some animal vectors. And I, I moved to Synestec a year ago, uh, primarily because of this very exciting technology that um, has been on the research front for a number of years and is now being commercialized to help supplement our efforts to manage uh, rodents, uh, particularly in, uh, in large animal uh, feed operations. Uh, so with that, let me just jump into a number of slides and then show some data we've generated primarily from poultry to date on not just impacts uh, against the rodent population through fertility management, but also the economic benefits to growers or farmers who start to look at this new approach to um, an age old problem, and that is uh, rodent control. So there are four points I would hope the audience uh, would take away from this discussion. Uh, number one, we're talking about rats primarily. We have a lot of research ongoing with other rodents and other uh, larger uh, hooved mammals as shown in the video, but essentially we're focusing on rats across the entire global ag business value chain. And today we'll focus on upstream or the farm. As you might know, and probably many of you have experienced, traditional rodent control relies on poisons. Uh, shortly after World War II, a whole range of new poisons came into the marketplace across agriculture. Uh, they have a role. Uh, but unfortunately, they've been uh, misused and overused primarily because there have been no other solutions available. When you use lethal rodenticides, you can have an impact immediately on a population. However, they, the population quickly rebounds due to the reproductive rate, which is what we at Synestec target. That's fertility or the reproductive rate to manage it. Uh, we have a solution that has been developed specifically for uh, rat population management. Uh, and it is um, essentially a tool that works against male and female rats. And uh, in doing so, selectively within an IPM program, you're able to, to lower the rat population to a level that you find to be best for the animal welfare and also best economically if that's, if that's one of your objectives uh, to improve your overall operations. So those are the four points I hope you would take away from this discussion. As I mentioned, the, uh, the global ag value chain is shown here from the far left where you have the growers of protein, animal protein or crops. Today we'll talk about the farm and specifically uh, animal impacts. And then all the way to the right, as you go from farmers to retailers, uh, rats impact uh, each one of these steps in different ways. Uh, we all know and have experienced, unfortunately, the effects of, of contamination 
uh, within our foodstuffs that can lead to complete recalls of, of uh, uh, protein and also uh, uh, crops from the retail shelves. So there's a lot of effort from federal regulators in many countries globally to try and prevent illness in humans by really regulating the, the, the food chain of, uh, of finished crops and protein that we consume. This is essentially a, a $2 trillion US, $2 trillion um, a market, if you will, and approximately 50% of that value uh, can be impacted by rodents some way along the way. So, so how do we try and intercept and work on um, an age-old problem with newer technologies? Let's just focus in on, on the behavior of these animals a little bit, okay? So, so rats, uh, rodentia, that's the animal order. They're, they've evolved a number of different traits which really help them capitalize on humans' uh, interest in consolidating food production, be it through mega protein farms, uh, we call here in the U.S. CAFOs, concentrated animal feed operations, to large-scale cropping systems. Um, those are both monoculture uh, philosophies, which are relatively recent in human history. And because of monoculture philosophy, you're creating an island of wonderful resource for all sorts of risk to pathogen and uh, pest outbreaks, including, including small mammals like rats. So on the left, a couple of traits that really help them become a problem for us, uh, they continually gnaw. Um, Rodentia really is Latin for to gnaw. So this, this is an early trait, I think established in the genome of the rat uh, millennia ago, which allows them to essentially just feed indiscriminately or keep chewing on things. Um, if they don't, they have, a, they have a pair of incisors on the top and bottom jaw that will keep growing and that prevent them from feeding. So they're always gnawing on something and chewing. Uh, because of this, they are generally considered omnivorous or they feed on a lot of different stuff from, from plant to animal protein to uh, carrion. Uh, <clears throat> they will concentrate uh, based on availability for specific food sources, but they generally can eat uh, literally uh, anything. They are considered habitat opportunists. So they have the ability to burrow to create harborage in, um, you know, buildings, obviously, in manure and farm refuse, uh, up into the ar arboreal uh, systems, up into trees and attics and above ground. So they can really capitalize on any food available and any habitat available. And the bottom line is they have a very high, high reproductive rate, which really prevents the ability of, of lethal methods to sustain any sort of population reduction. And the impacts we've seen, and you've seen very well uh, in this industry, is they consume directly stored food and also uh, crops that are growing on the stock in the field. Uh, they are very significant in their impact on, uh, on poultry, especially chicken, uh, eggs, pullets, et cetera, through direct predation, uh, damage. They're also quite a stressor, a biotic stressor in terms of, you know, uh, disrupting normal animal uh, life, uh, nipping at uh, chicken legs, hooves, et cetera, just, just being a pest. So that burns energy from the animal and causes that internal stress, which we've heard from previous um, presenters is a focus of, of optimization on the farm. How do you detect the stress in the animal and then how do you manage it? And we're trying to go upstream and say one of the causes of major stress in these, in these animals are commensal uh, rats and mice. Uh, they also attract predators. Um, they're not the top of the food chain, so they do bring in other predators, such as uh, uh, foxes or coyotes, et cetera. Uh, but a big one, of course, is transmission of disease within a farm and clearly between farms. So they're quite, quite significant uh, across the entire ag system. So today I'm going to focus in on the high reproductive rate, which we believe at Senestec uh, is clearly one of the major concerns for long term sustainable. A reduction in rat populations to help you out as a as a farming community. You saw in the video a little bit about what we call rat math. <laughs> um, essentially, this high reproductive rate can be captured in this slide, where uh, all you need to remember is on the far right, uh, you you can have up to about fifteen thousand or more uh, rodents from a single mating pair 
in the course of a year. Uh, we've all seen numbers like this. Uh, these are conservative numbers, but again, it makes it very difficult to get a handle when all you're doing is trying to kill uh, even 90% of your population with rodenticides alone without affecting the ability of the rat to reproduce. And that's where um, fertility management comes in. So when you take a look at this graph, we're trying to illustrate through some work done in the 1990s, the behavior of the rat population following large scale uh, lethal rodenticide or poisonings. And this was work done in New Zealand on a number of remote islands colonized by the uh, Norway and roof rat, uh, which are now global. Um, and these were large uh, scale forested regions from about 30 hectares to several thousand. So it's a big study. And no surprise, with the light green um, wavy line, you'll see that upon rodenticide application, you have a crash in the population. Population abundance drops very low, and then if you stop, it goes up. And you can repeat that process uh, through time. You never want to, of course, use lethals alone forever because number one, you have significant resistance issues that develop. Uh, number two, there are significant non-target and environmental bioaccumulation issues that develop with overuse, literally, of poisons. So the question is with this orange or red line, can you keep the population low? And this is where fertility control comes into play. Can fertility control reduce a population? And or more importantly, can you keep it low? And that's where um, our, our research has focused and where we've stepped forward with our first commercial product um, about four and a half years ago. And I'll be showing some data on some large scale long-term studies in poultry uh, in the States. So let's focus on fertility control for just a second. Again, in managing reproduction, we're trying to eliminate this rebound effect. And if you do it without lethal poisons, you also have beneficial effects on the non-target community, the environment, human and pet safety. So there's a lot of pluses around a fertility control product that doesn't have a traditional heavy, uh, you know, um, AI poison load. And the brand, uh, this, this is not a presentation on, on pitching any brand or product. It's just to represent the philosophy of fertility control with the first and only fertility control or fertility management product now in the market. It's called ContraPest, which is really a contraceptive bait designed to reduce fertility in male and female rats. So it must be consumed to be effective. It's not a sterilant. So if you remove it from the population, you will eventually return to normal reproductive rates. So it's a contraceptive. Uh, the formulation designed at Synestec is really a sweet, fatty, like a complete food source. And it's a liquid that's highly palatable to the rat. Uh, we didn't ask the rat, we didn't measure um, uh, heat sensing, et cetera. Although if we did, I'm sure we'd see some pleasure, maybe some dopamine receptors firing, but basically they love the stuff and they drink a lot of it if, if they had no other choice. It's compatible with other control tools, which are used, as we know, in different contexts. So there's no cross resistance or AI compatibility issues. Uh, and a, a number of studies uh, going in ag and municipal settings show it does prevent this rebound and it's registered in the US and we're looking at other, other partners across the, the globe are quite interested in this, uh, in this offering. So real quickly, one slide on how this works. On the left slide is a picture of a, of a rat follicle and highlighting that essentially early on in, um, in the development of the, of the ovarian follicle, contrapest essentially uh, rapidly matures it and prevents it from uh, continuing development and releasing uh, uh, and, uh, and becoming susceptible to fertilization. So it prevents, this is a normal process of, of ovarian maturation. All contrapest does is really rapidly accelerate it. In fact, the researchers who developed contrapest were focusing on, on human female cancer drugs, and they needed to create this is a little sidebar. They needed to create a line of lab rats and mice that went into premature um, menopause so they could test drugs, cancer drugs, on the rodent before the rodent 
passed away from old age. Uh, so uh, the, the target is just basically accelerating the natural process in the female rat. And on the right, it just cleaves the head and the, and the tail of, of sperm cells, uh, rendering them uh, uh, immobile. So again, it affects uh, fertility in both sexes. Okay, a couple slides on field results, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, these are just two large uh, field studies, and because we are a, a farm, a uh, smart farming conference, we're going to focus on a couple of ag studies in poultry hen farms, again, in the U.S., and I call them east and west. One occurred um, on the east coast of the U.S. and one on the west coast uh, in California. Uh, I'm located in the central part of uh, North America, essentially, in the upper Midwestern part. So I didn't mention earlier, but we, too, are finally seeing some spring-like weather after a pretty difficult um, winter. Um, so we'll talk about some data from two different uh, hen egg farms. And we use trail cameras to measure rat populations. Uh, so we quantify populations through the activity as captured on uh, trail cameras through movement. It's a lot of photos. We have a lot of technicians that count a lot of rats. Uh, we also age the rats, basically measuring from tip of nose to tip of tail, length of the rat, and then categorizing as juvenile or adult. Uh, it's tedious work, but it's been very fr fruitful for us to demonstrate um, population change through imagery. Of course, the cameras are placed in areas where we have known foraging patterns, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we also, of course, measure consumption of the bait. But for this purpose, I'm just going to show you the, the trail camera data or photos of, 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 of rats through time in the study. We also received economic impact data from one of the large farms uh, in the east that I'll show in one slide. And these are year-long studies. I actually continue today, but uh, the data was cut off a number of months ago for, for presentation purposes. Okay. So let's focus on farm uh, in the West. And this is a graph that shows uh, rat activities measured in trail cameras from uh, September of 2019 through uh, October of 2020. And essentially during the course of a month, we have uh, four camera days with multiple cameras set up across several barns in this large operation and would measure just through imagery and count number of rats on photos. And you know, there's obviously a lot of variation in activity of small mammals or rodents in farms. Uh, we know that, you know that, uh, we've seen it and it's captured here by the high um, uh, confidence interval shown around these means. But essentially what you'll see is a reduction uh, through time and eventually a stabilization and a lowering of the rat numbers by over 90%. Uh, across all four of these barns. Uh, this, this egg farmer is one of the top five egg producers in the U.S. So they have very uh, scientifically oriented operations people. Uh, they're all about big data, as some of the speakers have alluded to in the past. And they really welcomed our approach to try and quantify and, and work with them to see if this would be a nice tool for them. Uh, this work was done in context within their existing IPM program where they had some uh, poisons used and some snap traps, et cetera. But even though they had traditional IPM prior to September, 2019, which is the left data point, the rat numbers were um, unacceptable. And that's why they came to us to work with us to try and integrate fertility management into their, um, into their operations. So, uh, this this reduction in, in total rats observed is due to fewer rat births, and I'll show that on the next slide. Uh, it's essentially the same data set kind of split out by age class. So the dark bars are total rats, and uh, the bar to kind of focus in on would be um, the one on the far right within each time period, sort of the, the spotted. Um, I'm not sure if it's showing up on your screen, but basically the the lower of the, of the bar per time period. Those are the juveniles. And again, they were reduced over 90%. Now, as you know, ultimately the farmer doesn't really care about the number of juveniles, et cetera. They want to see fewer rats. So they've got improved productivity in their flocks what, or their weight gain or whatever they're measuring as a farmer. We wanted to demonstrate this 
internally and for scientific purposes that the driver of the population reduction is really due to fewer births. We can't go into the colonies and, and count you know, pups, so we use imagery and score whether you're an adult or juvenile, okay? So very effective here. Uh, the next data slide or table I'll show is from Farm East, and I'll just show the economic data there, which is provided by um, the farm operations manager. So same kind of program, long-term, and looked at uh, trail cameras, et cetera, but this is just the economic reported data from the farm. And there's my cue on the next slide. <laughs> okay. So this is a table that shows the metric measured that's important to the farmer. And then uh, the columns of numbers show the first column is their existing IPM program they had in place before using fertility management. And then with an integrated contrapest fertility control, what happened? So if you look at the far left, you'll see the various rows of, of uh, productivity measurements that are important. And this is a, an egg farm, so, so pullets are very important. I mean, that's really what they want to protect. And they had quite a bit of predation on the chicks using lethal methods alone. And they're estimating about, this is all in US dollars, my apologies, it's USD, that they were losing about $400,000 a year in pullet loss to rat predation. Okay, so below it, you had grain loss from rat consumption. Grain is spilled, rats consume the grain, a lot of gnawing on equipment, et cetera. We've seen this, many of you have seen it, especially those who work in poultry. And you also see equipment loss in non-poultry facilities. They are, rodentia are gnars, they chew on anything. Um, they also had an ongoing program, so lethal products, they were paying annually about 65,000 US dollars for existing lethal methods, which weren't giving them the control that they needed. Contrapest or this fertility management uh, piece, you'll see in the very first column of lethal methods alone is a zero because they weren't using it initially. That's why they had problems. And they were paying, um, wages for up to eight of their staff uh, to control and um, repair damage caused by rats. They, they, this is all in-house. They had people, part of their jobs were uh, rodent control. So they were losing at minimum 900,000 uh, up to 1.5 million per year from rodents alone uh, in this large egg facility in the Eastern US. This was another one of the top five um, egg producers in the U.S. So we came in with Contrapest and again, uh, looking at cameras and, and just looking at the habitat in the, in the uh, farms, should say in the barns, try to estimate and work with the best place to place uh, the baits and also then how best to monitor the activity. And you'll note um, down below, I have a little asterisk that Initially, when you use fertility control with high populations, you have to go out and, and make sure you, you introduce enough of your intervention to start to have an effect on the population. It's like with anything. If you want to fertilize your, your plants at home or your garden or whatever it is, you have to apply the right dose for an expected result. So we went in with an expected rate of contrapest. And then with time, the rat population declined and therefore the use of fertility management also declined. So in the far right column, you'll see that under contrapest cost, the farm was spending about 5,000 US dollars per year for contrapest. But if you look at all the other numbers in that column, they're far less than the lethal methods alone column, which is what you'd expect with reduced populations of rats. So they're estimating about total contrapest added column of about $300,000. It's still losses to the grower, to the farmer. You know, this is not, you're not gonna eradicate the rodent from large ag systems. You have to know how to manage them to low enough levels that make economic sense 
and animal welfare sense for your operation. So here, you're estimating about a 600,000 US dollar savings. That's the difference between the two columns when you add contrapest. And let me add that this work at this farm continues where they're trying to look at, can they reduce the lethal uh, input load? In other words, can they reduce the number of snap traps used in certain areas? Can we reduce the need for contrapest further? Of course, they do exclusion and sanitation, et cetera, all part of an IPM program. But this is another example of how fertility management as a new idea to a very old problem of rat control can help uh, the ag industry produce more protein and we think improve the, the, um, the livelihood and the value of, of the animals who are affected by, by rats. So this is my last slide in terms of just data, but this falls into what we're all familiar with, which is called integrated pest management. And fertility management really represents two parts to the puzzle. We try and prevent the problem from developing in the first place. But more importantly, you really try and control the level of that, that population of rodent that best suits your needs. This is not a prescription where I take two um, ibuprofen in the morning or a vitamin tab and this is how it works for everybody. We all know as humans, or in this case as unique ag operators on farms, that they're all different. And the differences have to be considered when you develop an IPM program. So in the middle of this machinery, these cogs represent parts of a machine that all work together. Fertility management seems to be a very important piece to making everything work better. It helps other interventions perform better because there are fewer rats, in this case, of pressuring your animals and your systems. And that allows you to focus more on what really matters most to you as a, a farmer or grower uh, on, on your business and what matters most to you. So that's my uh, overview of um, fertility management and what this new tool uh, provided into the agribusiness road control world represents. And I would like to um, I thank obviously the sponsors and others for participation. And this is my contact information uh, that others I know have shared. And I, I would hope to hear from you. I look forward to spending more time with uh, the farmer community here. Uh, there's a lot of interest, not only in the US, but also we have colleagues in Europe and, and beyond uh, for fertility management. Um, we're looking at different formulations. This is a liquid palatable formulation, but of course, in some systems, especially in cropping systems that require more of a broadcast application, would require a different formulation. Uh, but to me, as a biologist, uh, being able to go after the root of a problem, which is reproduction, in a humane way, uh, is an extremely important step in the right direction to uh, 21st century farming and beyond. So uh, with that, uh, that's all I have for you today. I thank you for your time and and uh, hope to be in contact with you in the future. Of course, uh, Steve. Anyway, thank you for your presentation. Um, before moving to the Q&A, of course, uh, uh, you are our uh, virtual tour uh, sponsor, so we have uh, a virtual tour. So please use as well this time for the virtual tour if you have any question to the Steve's uh, presentation. So let's launch now the virtual tour of SenseTech. Rats reproduce at such a high rate that infestations can be difficult to manage. If you have a rat infestation that exceeds 500 rats, let's look at different scenarios for controlling them. Using lethal methods alone, the infestation that reached 500 quickly decreases. But within two months, the population is back and growing rapidly. In the second scenario, the rat population is controlled using Contrapest, a contraceptive product for both males and females. Within three months, the population has decreased 36%. By one year, 
the population has declined by 78 percent. Sustained use continues to drive down the population. In the final scenario, the pest management professional deployed an integrated approach by first using a lethal method. This dropped the rat population by 90 percent within the first two months. Contrapest was added to both manage and reduce future populations. Either way, Contrapest is the answer. So, welcome back now after the virtual tour offered by Senestech. So, I hope now, Steve, you are ready to answer to the, to the question from the audience. Yes. There are many, many of them. So let's let's move. The first one. As, uh, as you know, this uh, no, maybe you were considering the presentation, but it was Michel, your your colleague, was uh, answering to some of them. Huh? But I give just, of course, the opportunity to answer once again. So, what is the lifespan of a rat? Well, it depends on the habitat and the rat species. There are many different species of rats. They uh, live in a variety of different habitats and have various stressors. Uh, for themselves. So on average, you know, outside of laboratory rats, lab rats, uh, six, 10 months or so is, is sort of an average. Right. So let's move to the next one. What is the fertility rate ratio in the males and females? 50, 50, 50, 50. All right. So let's move to the, if, if I understand the, if I understand the question, it's, uh, you know, any population would balance to essentially 50% male and female, generally a few more females and males in general, but basically 50-50. Um, mm -hmm. What's most important in terms of fertility management, of course, is female, female fertility management. Because it only takes one male to inseminate many, many, many female rats. So if you only focus on males, you're you're kind of missing the boat because 99% control of males, that one male would be uh, mm. just a happy rat, right? Yes. So you have to, you focus on both, but you really need to make sure you get the female fertility control piece correct first. Mm. Right, so, uh, okay, could the use of ContraPet, okay, it's a United, United Ward because it's the name of the brand. So you can, uh, the use of ContraPest and the, rodenticide reduce rats completely? Uh, sure. In fact, uh, either one of those alone could theoretically reduce rodents to zero, depending on a number of factors. One, are the populations of rats relatively isolated? Or are they receiving new immigrants through shipments of grain from surrounding fields, etc.? So you have to know the context of your farm if you're essentially an island, a large, for example, feed mill away from a lot of other inputs. Um, the issue with using one or the other uh, alone is just time to control. You can use heavy dosing of poisons, literally like a hammer, and control those. It's very, very difficult to kill every single rat, which would require each rat to eat a lethal dose of poison. Mm -hmm. With contrapest, you can reduce the number of births eventually to so low that they'll be so low you don't find mating pairs. And then when they're not unable to mate, the population dies out. All right. So let's move to the, uh, to the next one. So hi, Steve. Can fertility control reduce population abundance to leave us close to 0%? If you fight rats, you basically want to eliminate it 100 percent. Right. I think you definitely the goal for you know pest in general is to reduce your pest, in this case rats, to levels below a threshold that affect animal welfare, productivity, etc. I think what the ag communities realize, especially at, at farms of certain scale, is that you really can't eliminate all risk to some disease and to some pests. But you can certainly strive to reduce it as low as possible. 
So on paper, and I think historically, when some of the poisons first came out, that was definitely the goal. We can control nature. Mm -hmm. We can control these to zero. But I think based on your operations and taking a very objective look at it, you say to yourself, look, we've always had some issues. They might be burrowing below ground. How do we really take a hard look at the ecology of that local population and do everything we can to get them as close to zero as possible? Right, thank you, Steve. So let's move to the, to the next one. This, uh, this, uh, actually, this attendee was one of the most active in, uh, during your presentation. It's already the third question. And uh, it's mainly related to the contrapest, so it's more a commercial. So it's, uh, I believe it's more related to the commercial part. Can I get contrapest in, in Kenya? Uh, not today. Uh, contrapest was registered in the U.S., uh, was registered in 2016, I think I showed on one of my slides. Uh, we have quite a bit of interest from different partners. However, um, we don't have any direct interest in the African cotton today. Most of it is uh, from Europe, uh, obviously Budapest, um, uh, the mm -hmm. Middle East a bit, uh, Australia, Southeast Asia. But I think more and more interest will, will grow into this, um, into this category. Mm -hmm. of rodent control um, and anybody out there who's interested in it or would like to see it in their country please shoot me an email and we can begin a dialogue and I, I have my contact and of course it'll be sent out later but i'm sorry today in kenya and i've spent a lot of time in kenya on malaria in particular in the past beautiful country i enjoy working there and maybe someday get back there to help um uh, with the rat with the rat problems if you're okay steve i can uh, display your email address I can display your email address so you can get in touch with him. So this is sure. your email address. So and uh, please uh, just... Um, sure, just drop me a note. It. Yeah, just uh, write me a note, of course. And uh, now uh, you anticipate actually another question which, because it's related to the European Union. So when do you expect a regulatory approval in the European Union? Uh, the... <laughs> Currently, with what we've learned through the EU regulatory bodies, uh, with my experience on the insecticide front, herbicide front, and now rodenticide front, is it's not easy. And it takes a long time. Uh, but it's a very, very important region for us with this offering. So at this point in time, we don't have in place specific plans for uh, EU regulatory. But it's it's very much on the on the board of evaluation because it's very important outside of you know uh, pesticide load and need. But we don't have um, a plan in place for when we expect it in the EU. If anybody is online and has some interest in it in the EU and can help us along that way, we're we are. I'll just back up. We are a small uh, company. We're a publicly traded company. We're small, based in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, and uh, we look towards partners and others who share the same uh, philosophy or mindset around what this represents to this age-old problem. Uh, I wish I had better news for you in the EU today, but maybe in the future we will. So thank you for your question. All right. So the, there is uh, one more in a while it came. And then I have one uh, my personal, so be prepared. So much has been shown about stress and decrease in animal well-being. Do rats increase stress in animals? And what is the impact on protein production? Yeah, excellent question. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not in the academic literature as I once was. We have a research group that is. Uh, but from my memory, I mean, clearly we know that stress uh, by rats in particular can be a significant problem for uh, many different uh, protein production facilities. We know there's direct predation. We quantify that with the uh, with the with the pullet loss on egg farms. Uh, there's a lot of literature, of course, on impacts to uh, chicken feet and to uh, piglets just through nipping. In fact, there's quite a bit of research on uh, impacts to humans, especially in lower income housing in many different countries where. The rats come out and they sense the, the milk on a baby's breath or elsewhere and they kind of nip at the at the infants. So there's there's that level of impact. Um, 
on protein production, I, I know there's some data out there. I don't have it off the top of my head, but in talking and just thinking about some of the work presented here, whether it be turkey farms or others, uh, I, I know that heavy loads from pests like rats uh, stress animals out significantly and do cause a loss in, in weight or in uh, milk production or whatever is your, your metric of interest. I've done a lot of work in the past on, uh, on beef, cattle, and dairy production, milk production, as a result of impact from biting flies and mosquitoes. And so to me, different type of animal here, but I think the same sort of impact where spending too much time being bothered, and this was just touched on earlier uh, in the presentation on animal welfare, you can sense the stress. So we can measure that and ultimately protein loss. And in this case, um, if you quantify and know that it's rats, then you definitely you know, have a reason to be a little bit more proactive in, in rodent control. Right, and uh, the same guy, is uh, the, the guy who made the question related to, to Kenya, he wrote this, uh, so thanks a lot, Steve, and let's catch up offline. Okay, very good. He, well, regarding as well, I wanted to ask you, regarding the, as well the rats, uh, this is uh, my, my question, actually. Regarding the rats, the, um, and related to the contrapest, so do, are you currently as well using uh, a different uh, amount uh, based on the, the kind of rats? And as well, because of course, uh, uh, from the US, the rats from US, uh, they have a certain resistance, which is completely different, uh, and different, aliment and di different uh, uh, foods, of course, and in, in the different diet they are using, of course, to the Europeans, for example. So, but are you using a different uh, uh, amount of uh, contrapest based on the, or basically you're using the same strategy or in the same amount for contrapest? Yeah, that's a, that's a really important question and I'm glad you raised it. Um, and it's a major effort for our research, our field development research team. And that is, you know, contrapest comes in uh, 400 milliliter plastic tanks deployed through traditional bait stations. The art of deployment is to figure out the forging behavior of the rodent, the rat, and then how much contrapest to place out where and when. And, and here, like in Europe, in general, there are two main rat species we all deal with in, in North and Southern Hemisphere. One is the brown rat or Norway rat, and also the other is the black rat or um, roof rat. And they were transported on ships uh, centuries ago, and now they're everywhere. Uh, so those habitats are a little bit different. One is more arboreal and one is more terrestrial. But the work we're focusing in on is within a traditional IPM system, you know, what percentage of those bait stations that are currently used should be fertility management? Hmm. Because people which makes sense if you think about it. They don't want to just jump right into, let's just only use fertility management alone. If you want to try that and you have a contained area in an isolated barn, for example, or an isolated commercial store somewhere, great. Mm -hmm. But many people don't want, to, don't want to try something new just like that, especially farmers. So my, my ancestors in, in Wisconsin are all German and Dutch dairy farmers historically from the mid 19th century. And I know for a fact, they wouldn't just jump in a new technology to treat a field or to, to manage their herds. Same with rodenticide. So we're trying to introduce it and see what level. Clearly, if you have a high population or maybe a sense of urgency, you wanna try more earlier, but it's really, at this point, we don't really have algorithms to uh, build essentially AI recommendations for use based on square footage or, or density, but we're trying to get a sense of what level of deployment coverage is needed. And it's really on a case by case study. Uh, most of our work to date has been in uh, chicken poultry, uh, some work in swine, a little bit in, in uh, equine, uh, and we're looking for more and more ag opportunities in different areas. Uh, there's a lot of interest. We're just trying to identify where it makes the most sense to try because you have to have um, an infrastructure and capability to, to understand and, and measure and, and see how well this works for you and for 
the individual farmer. So good question. Very good question. No, well, I would think during the as well during your presentation, I don't know. I wanted to wait as well the the question from the audience first, and just to I wanted to sometimes I like if uh, just to ask some questions. So, so of course. Um, I'm not here just only as a presenter because, of course, I believe in the event. I was searching as well for the for for the speakers and uh, new solutions uh, as well. I'm we already thinking for the for the third angle already from from now. So let me. I don't know if uh, there are okay. Th yeah, there is uh, another um, um, from the audience. Another comment. It's written simply. Thanks. <laughs> Only if, uh, yeah, because uh, some of them they were as well mentioning that maybe uh, the rodents is one of the most uh, um, uh, not just most of the people they are not thinking about the the, the problem of the rodents. And uh, actually, when we had the pre-conference call, just uh, you open uh, completely my mind because I didn't think about it. For example about the problem of the road. I'm really happy, first of all, you decided as well to believe in uh, our, uh, our event uh, this year, in our conference. I really push uh, any way to display uh, your time. So please, uh, the work that you can uh, if you have any questions regarding the uh, regarding the tech and in particular about the future pest, please feel free to uh, uh, drop an email to us to see and I, I believe you are the more than happy to answer. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Um, and you're you're right. It is a it's an it's a an old problem we've had for centuries and centuries, and it doesn't get a lot of attention because it's not a big market per se. But for me, there's so much focus on productivity and efficiencies, which is great. How can we just sort of go upstream and try and reduce one of the major stressors? that are found in farm animal operations. And that's where I think fertility management has a long-term role to play and we're excited for the future. So thank you very much. No, it is a pleasure and, uh, for, for you, Stephen. And I think as well, I would like to say, I really thank as well to Michelle, your director of marketing was really helpful as well to, pre to prepare the presentation. And uh, for us, as I mentioned to all the, the speakers, it's a pleasure to have you on board once again and on the BCF board. Thank you. Have a Thank nice you. day. Thank you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.